just want to move on to the keynote. We're very pleased to have uh, Steve Hart from General Motors and NASA, who's going to talk about uh, real-time control on the Robonaut robot. It's very exciting to have robots in space, so um, particularly ones that are running the kind of software that we're all familiar with. So without more ado, please welcome Steve Hart. Um, so, slight change of topic. Uh, we're not talking too much about the real-time control um, aspects of the Robonaut project, but uh, I invite everybody to come to a Birds of a Feather session at 10.30 right after this um, next door, where we'll talk more about the low-level control systems um, and how we're, how we're moving forward with that. Um, I'm going to step back and take a little bit more of a high-level general view of um, how we're programming Robonaut these days, uh, what we've done with it, uh, both on the ground and, and on the International Space Station. Uh, and where we're going and, and what we hope to accomplish over the next um, number of years. Um, in, in, a, in a very general sense, so um, what we're interested in doing with the Robonaut project is really building the next generation of flexible, uh, dexterous, complex robots that can be used to assist uh, humans in, in factory settings, in space settings, uh, et cetera. So uh, just a quick, very quick overview of, the, of how the project got started. So the Robonaut 1 project started in the late, mid to late 90s, uh, purely out of, uh, out of NASA. Uh, and there was a large DARPA project that um, included a number of universities uh, for the first four or five years. But around 2006, 2007, General Motors started looking around at the, uh, the field of humanoid uh, robo robotics uh, or, or dexterous robotics and trying to find somebody to partner with, really pushing towards uh, how we can build uh, dexterous manipulators for flexible automation, uh, moving forward towards uh, future goals of advanced manufacturing where we can move away from the traditional industrial robotic settings where everything is fixtured, things are dangerous, robots are in cages, et cetera. Um, before I move on, I just want to thank all of the uh, people who, could, who helped contribute to the work and the, the talk uh, that I'm uh, going to give today. A number of these people are here, uh, Brian, Paul, JD, Julia, Phil, um, all of these, these guys are in the audience, so um, feel free to talk to any of them any of them about any of the stuff we're, uh, we're talking about, um, but as well as other, other members of the NASA and GM team. Um, so like I said, the, the NASA GM Robonaut vision is really to have robots, smart robots capable of working with humans to help, uh, to help assist them with real work, real industrial, real manipulation or assembly work. Uh, and this is true both in the space settings to help with repairs and chores around something like the International Space Station and maybe you know, ultimately uh, planetary exploration. Uh, and NGM to help with the factory workers to relieve some of the ergonomic challenges that the, the, the plant workers have to go through doing repetitive tasks all day long. Um, if you can have a robot help, helping them out, helping with you know, taking over, collaborating, et cetera, um, and then also backing off on some of the strict guidelines, like again, the fixtured parts and, and dangerous uh, systems where you have to keep them as, away from humans. Um, you put humans next to them, things get messy. When things get messy, you need better perception, you need better smarts, you need better autonomy. Um, and, and, and flexibility, both with the hardware to make sure they don't hurt people and in terms of the software. Um, so yeah, they have to be safe, uh, just emphasize that. And that's all about the ro Robonaut, um, how it's physically safe to, to work right next to you. Um, and of course, ultimately we want the robots to be programmable by people that aren't roboticists, that aren't necessarily people like us who can go in and hack in a terminal, et cetera. We need possibly very smart people, but you know, people who don't sit around and, and you know, download packages from Ubuntu all day long. Um, so let me just give a um, quick overview of, of Robonite itself. Oh, stop playing. Man. This was the Robonite video, showing what it does. I could probably act it out. I've seen it so many times at this point. But um, <laughs> so Robonaut, uh, as you can see, is, is a bimanual, uh, five-fingered hand, uh, upper body torso uh, robot. It's got a series elastic actuation, or a series elastic actuators in the upper five joints of each of the arms and also on the, the single degree of freedom waist, uh, linear actuators for the two wrist degrees of freedom, and then um, a 12 degree of freedom uh, hand, tendon-driven hand. Uh, the, the robot's controlled basically through an impedance actuation scheme, or impedance control scheme, where we can control the stiffnesses and the uh, damping coefficients and characteristics, both in uh, Cartesian space as sort of a high priority control uh, objective, and also in joint space, so we can do things like move the elbows out of the way, be safe, et cetera. I mean, the, the, the impedance control paradigm is really part of this safety uh, view that we have, where we really need to be able to be compliant when we're working around, around humans. Um, Robonaut also has a three-degree freedom head, uh, two tilt and a, and a pan uh, joint, 
and um, a number of sensing uh, sy systems in its head. Analog cameras that we mainly use for teleoperation, but also high definition, uh, giggy digital cameras, and um, as of recently, an ASUS 3D depth sensor. So hopefully maybe I'll come back to that and you can actually see him in action, but there should be other videos of him, I believe, throughout. Um, so uh, as some of you may know, we, we flew a, uh, a version of, or a slightly upgraded version of Robonaut 2 to the International Space Station in February of last year. It took about six months to actually get him out of the box. Uh, astronaut time is kind of uh, expensive and, and, and hard to come by, so you know, they get around to things, um, so it takes a little bit, little, little while to do anything up there. Um, but after, um, after about six months, they unpacked him, and then they started the checkout process just to make sure that all of the, all of the systems survived the, the journey. It's kind of a rough ride up to space, so um, they had to take it slow. And we really had to learn how to program and how to deal with a robot that's 200 miles above us that we can't directly necessarily log into or control and that we have to go through a number of different people that aren't us and, again, aren't roboticists in order to do anything. You know, we can sit behind someone who has a number of commands that are, are legal to type into the terminals, to, um, et cetera, or the astronauts themselves who are up there and who have been trained to, to use Robonaut at, at a high level um, and also potentially to repair, uh, repair the robot if, if anything goes wrong, which, fortunately, things have been pretty good so far. Um, so the, here's a number of pictures of... of um, Here's a number of pictures of uh, astronauts with, with Robonaut. Um, even a picture of uh, Robonaut right here performing um, Hello World in sign language. Uh, he can't speak, but he can, uh, he, can, he can do sign language. So we thought it would be nice to, to do a Hello World app um, you know, to the actual world. Uh, uh, this is also uh, the first humanoid robot handshake in space. A little, little hokey, but kind of cool. It was also referred to on uh, Saturday Night Live um, which we, we were pretty happy about. Um, they, they said, you know, we saw it as the first humanoid handshake, but the robot saw it as phase one. <laughs> okay. um, all right, well, you know, the talk will be a little shorter, and then maybe hopefully we can come back to it. Um, at least there's a picture here. So uh, once we, we went through the checkout, once we did some gain tuning for zero gravity, uh, you know, stuff we couldn't necessarily do uh, very well on the ground, um, we started looking at what tasks we could actually perform. The robot right here, as you can see, is not mobile. He's, he's on this stanchion that we have. Uh, and he can turn around, but, um, but that's about it. Uh, but there were some things that the astronauts were, were interested in seeing if, if we could get Robonaut to, to help out with. There's one particular task called a VelociCalc. Um, it's basically a measurement device with a telescoping rod uh, that they have to put and hold in front of air filters on the station just to make sure airflow is all right. I mean, obviously, uh, an important thing in space. Um, but it's tedious. The astronauts have to st stand there and hold this thing still, and of course they're floating around trying not to move too much. So they asked, you know, could we get Robonaut to do this? And, and so we said, all right, let's do it. Uh, so we, we programmed up a script to, to, um, to do this, and the robot used its sensors to read the device, held the, the tool, and moved it around. And the astronauts were able to sort of tweak the position of it just to um, line things up appropriately. And it took six hours, but, you know, it's a start. At least we, uh, we saw we could do it. Um, so that's just sort of indicative of the sorts of things that we're hoping that uh, we can get the robot to do, again, to help out with, um, with uh, chores and, and routine activities up there to, to reduce the number of um, tedious things and th the astronauts can do and free up other time for, for more interesting things. Uh, well, I'll come back to it. All right, here's Robonaut in action, finally. Um, dexterous hands, five-finger hands. Um, about 80 to 90 percent of the Kokoski grasp taxonomy is sort of what we were shooting for. Um, if people are familiar with that, you know, really the ability to use the same tools as, as humans so that um, just like in, in, well, both in the space situation where it's very expensive to send new tools, custom tools, um, I think there's a drill up there that costs about $2 million to, to build, test, you know, vibration testing, radiation testing, et cetera. It's very costly to send new things up to space. So, and the space station, of course, was designed to be repaired, built, maintained by humans, human hands, uh, or humans in, in astronaut suits. Um, and so the Robonaut form factor is about a human uh, in an astronaut uh, suit uh, form factor. Uh, this is, and, and the ability to use the human tools, obviously, is important for the, the factory setting as well, where, um, again, rather than creating custom end effectors where you have to shut down 
um, cells in the plant um, to replace anything. If, if the robot can use the same tools, then that's great. You can save some of that extra overhead cost. It's a strong robot. You can hold about 40 pounds in each of the arms, uh, about 20 pounds in each of the hands, because again, they're tendon-driven, so a little bit more fragile. Uh, but he's still within about the 99th percentile of, of human shape uh, form factor, smaller than Schwarzenegger at its peak. Uh, you can see that's Ron Diffler, the project manager at NASA, uh, showing the compliance of the robot as it moves. It's very safe to, to just sort of get in the way. and. and um, Um, both with the, with the weight that we showed, the, the robot actually has some ability to actually really impart, impart real forces and, and do real work. Um, the dexterous hands allow the robot to, to also be able to um, manipulate uh, non-rigid objects like this, uh, this space blanket, we call it. Um, it's a material that's all over the space station. Um, really covering that range of flexible material and strength is, is something that, that we, we found imperative to, to the design of the robot. Now, most of these videos here, just this collage, are showing off the, the capabilities of the system. Most of the, the, the programs are very scripted, you know, joint, even joint level commands. Um, but again, just to exhibit the, what the robot is potentially capable uh, of. Here's that VelociCalc. Um, that is uh, the view from the digital cameras of the of Robonaut itself. Uh, that's uh, that's Dan Burbank. Dan Burbank, yeah, astronaut Dan Burbank. One of the two that are up there that have been trained specifically to be uh, Robonaut operators. Um, you can see that telescoping device in front of the airflow filter or the air filter. Um, interesting thing to note, just uh, you know, for curiosity, see all the uh, the essentially noise in in the image. Uh, Radiation degradation on the cameras happens really quickly. Um, so as we leave it on for a couple hours, we just see the pixels die. Um, so interesting challenges that we don't usually really have to deal with and think about too much on the ground. Uh, before I leave this, just, uh, you know, just take a note of this picture and, and see how much of a mess space station is on the inside. Um, Uh, here is, uh, is where we saw before. Um, so, of course, there's no up or down in space. So, you know, we have to get used to that as we look at it. Um, uh, we sent up this, this busy board. Uh, this is a series of four, uh, four panels that have a number of different switches, connectors, uh, uh, buttons, et cetera, things that are, are very sort of canonical uh, devices that are all around the space station. Uh, they don't really do much here, and you're, we're pushing buttons, et cetera, but really this, we sent this up to see uh, so we could learn about the process of programming the robot. It's really to earn our stripes. You know, can we actually effectively send programs up to the robot, build in uh, functionality, build in the smarts to the system so that the robot can actually perform these, um, these, uh, these manipulation tasks in the hope that as we um, you know, move forward in the project, the robot actually might be able to use you know, real switches that are doing real things. Um, this is fairly recently. This is only in the last couple, couple weeks. Um, and this is our first successful test of doing a real, you know, real manipulation task. We, we let the astronauts choose you know, which buttons th the robot should push, um, and I think they pushed 18 successful buttons, um, which is you know, which is pretty good. Um, flipping the switch, turning the power on, etc. Um, there's even some. Um, well, all right, that's all I'll say. Not much vision here uh, in terms of visual processing. Um, verification, uh, well, what we want to do here is, is the robot can perform an, a speci specific action and then can use its vision system to verify whether it worked or not. So did the light turn on, did it not, and then can you know, try again if not and adjust its strategy. Okay, so how did we program the system? What, what was the interface that, that, that we created in order to, um, to write the programs and to let the robot, or sorry, the astronauts um, actually uh, program Robonaut. This is what we call the R2 uh, command, command and control or commander or um, the GUI kind of lazily. Um, this was a custom built C Sharp application that runs on Windows XP. Uh, you can see how uh, up on the top, it's a series of essentially set points. Uh, each blue, blue block there is uh, uh, either a Cartesian or a joint command. Um, that will get sent down to the robot. There's different com completion conditions as you leave each block, like you know, 
timeout or did I actually reach uh, the goal that it went to or just move, move on. Uh, it's very linear. Uh, there's a, some limited capabilities for asynchronous and, and um, you know, nonlinear programming, but by and large, this is, this is sort of how we've programmed the robot. Um, and there's lots of different state verification and data monitoring um, things, or even some slider controls, et cetera. Uh, and uh, basically how it works is we have the robot, and the robot com communicates, uh, the, the online control systems are on board the robot, uh, or the real-time control systems are on the robot, and then Commander will run on a, uh, on a computer, on a PC, uh, actually a, a ThinkPad, they have a number of those up on the station, and communicates with uh, the robot over Ethernet, um, just sending down these set points from, from the control, um, from Commander to the controllers. More specifically, how it works is on board the system, we run VxWorks, which is a real-time operating system, sort of tried and true um, for space applications. Uh, the application itself, the control application, is written in a program called Control Shell, um, which, um, which isn't around too much anymore, but uh, we've used for about 10, 15 years on, on the Robonaut project. Uh, and Commander runs on Windows XP um, off board the system. The, the Commander application is the non-real-time layer. That's where we write the applications, the not safety critical um, code. Uh, which gives us a little bit more freedom. You know, we can make certain guarantees about the control layer, uh, what's happening on board the robot, and safety is guaranteed at that level uh, and performance, but we can be, um, I want to say sloppy, but because uh, that's not right, but um, we have a little bit more freedom at the higher level, at the application level, to experiment with, uh, with getting the robot to do things. Uh, the communication layer between uh, the control layer and commander is, is using the uh, network data delivery system. Um, or NDDS uh, transport layer. It's the messaging publish subscribe layer. So there's some really good things about Commander. Um, it's centralized control, which is very important both for space and manufacturing applications where uh, an operator can really just go into one single place and see what's actually going on. They don't have to monitor 16 different terminals or, you know. Um, it's a visual programming language, which was, is very good when you have these non-robotics hackers who are actually running the, running the uh, program. That, that there's some very intuitive ways about actually getting the robot to perform behavior. Um, and it's very easy to monitor the, the program flow with, uh, with uh, this VPL. Um, data visualization, as you can see, and even some uh, hierarchical encapsulation where entire scripts can be uh, essentially reduced down to what are the green triangles up there. So, you know, a little bit easier to manage and, and reorganize things. But what were the cons of this? Well, the, the program was very specific to the particular of configuration of R2 as it was originally built. Uh, if we added any sensors, if we changed any of the infrastructure, it basically was a recompile on the C-sharp layer, um, which is cumbersome and tedious and uh, difficult to really you know, build in new functionality easily. Um, more than that, as I said, it's all set point control, so it's very hard to put any sort of computational math in there. Um, you know, where do you put the algorithms? It's not entirely clear. You can do it a little bit with playing nifty tricks with um, you know, the VPL, but if anybody's ever tried to do even things like you know, for loops, it, it gets cumbersome pretty quick. Um, and although we have the, the hierarchical encapsulation, there's no reusability. It's not like we can take a sub-piece of a program, uh, save it off somewhere, and then reuse it anywhere else. We can cut and paste, but even that sort of limited capabilities. Um, it's also platform specific. Um, that's not necessarily a problem other than the fact that it's platform, the platform is Windows. Um, so, you know, uh, it's non-distributable. It's one particular uh, program that runs on one laptop at any given time. Um, so all of the computation has to be done at that point. And communicating between Commander and anything else, any uh, third-party applications, any custom sensing applications, uh, any scripts that are, that are not in Commander is very difficult. It's cumbersome. You can go in there, but again, it's sort of a recompile or at least a significant um, uh, configuration upgrade in order to, uh, to do anything that's not, that wasn't in the direct um, initial capabilities of Commander. But, but here's the thing. I mean, this is basically the status quo of how manufacturing and space robotics is, uh, robots are programmed. Um, I would even say that it's one of the, uh, you know, the best and, and most flexible versions of how robots are, are actually uh, programmed in, in these configurations. Um, so just some examples. So you know, typical manufacturing applications, we have this teach pendant here. There's a bunch of ABB, ABB robots here. Um, and operators can take the teach pendant and go through uh, and teach uh, you know, set point control in the same sort of way. Uh, as commander, or you can actually grab hold of the robot as we see this operator doing and teach a particular skill. Um, up top, we see the uh, special purpose dexterous manipulator that's on, on the space station, and that's actually the, the, the GUI that actually controls that. Lots of buttons, you know, 8-bit graphics, et cetera. Um, 
very cumbersome to really do much of anything. And it's, it's for a very spe specific purpose, uh, as the name belays. But um, you know, again, very hard to do things like math. And, uh, and one of the issues is that as the systems get more complex, you know, if we have just a seven DOF arm with a gripper, okay, maybe we can do, th do things this way. But as we get to systems that have you know, multiple robot systems or even the complication of, 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 of SPDM there, um, then to really do sophisticated things, it's, it's not possible to, to do this set to set or set point control, nor is it really feasible to do complete teleoperation uh, just because it's very hard to to visualize and to get in any sort of suit that can actually take advantage of you know, like a 30 robot system, et cetera. But here's the thing, I mean, we need something different. I mean, this is where we're going, right? Uh, we want to get Robonaut off, the, off his pedestal on Space Station and we need him moving around and doing stuff. And this is gonna be a significant challenge for, for um, at a level of autonomy or at least semi-autonomy that's well beyond what we're capable of doing with the status quo of manufacturing and, and industrial robotics. Um, I believe. Uh, I mean, as you can see, uh, there, there's going to have to be you know, significant improvements on autonomy, on motion planning, on trajectory generation, on um, manipulation. And I am just, I just want to emphasize that, I mean, I, I, we can't do it using the status quo. Uh, so I should say this is, this, um, it's pretty. This isn't a real simulation. This is pure graphics animation done by NASA's uh, graphics uh, animation department. So there's no motion planning going on here. This is all essentially computer graphics. Um, still impressive, I don't know how they did it, but you know. Um. So we're building legs. Uh, we have prototype legs, and in the next year and a half, we hope to actually send these up and attach them to the upper body that's on the space station. This is super exciting. Um, we're, very, we're very happy to do this, and, and it's gonna open up the possibilities of Robonaut on the space station. M move it away from just the sort of checkout, kind of push a button, but actually getting the robot to do real things um, and really help the astronauts out on the space station. So how do we get there? Uh, so I wanna argue that there are three high level uh, points that, I, that we, we're gonna need to incorporate in order to move from the status quo into, um, into the future. Um, first of all, uh, autonomy. We need more, at least semi-supervised autonomy. Let the robot take over and do some of the things on its own. Uh, don't just send long lists of joint commands. It, it's not possible. You need to actually have significant uh, closed loop behavior on the perceptual side, on the motor side, have motion plans that the robot can generate on its own, and modify if, it need, if need be. Um, but we need some more autonomy on the part of the robot. It needs to start making some decision, decisions on its own to offload the burden for the, for the programmers. Um, but we still need to maintain that we need end user interfaces that are um, feasible for, uh, for people that aren't us to actually go in and program. We need the complex behavior, but we need to make sure that people that um, don't necessarily have to see all the details, but they can still program complex and, and potentially you know, smart autonomous behavior. Of course, you know, we'll need, still need intuitive feedback to, to the operators um, and the, and the uh, interfaces for um, letting these people, these users, build more and more complicated behavior over time um, without having to, to call in the, the robotics experts. Um, and and arguably, arguably most importantly, we need robustness. Uh, we can do this, we can add the autonomy, but as, as everyone here probably knows, you start, you start putting in autonomy and, um, and robustness sort of suffers, right? We need to make sure that when we add this autonomy in there that the robots can still do what they're meant to do reliably. If things go wrong, it's not catastrophic. It doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't send an astronaut through the wall of the space station. I mean, all very important things. It needs to be reliable. Um, and so there's a lot of, lot of different areas. I'll talk about a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, what robustness really means, but, um, uh, but yeah, we'll get there. So. Here's some, some initial preliminary tests in terms of autonomy. Here's an example of Robonaut um, performing a uh, drill or a bolt tightening task with a drill. Uh, this, just, this, is, this is the beginning of the sort of paradigm shift of point to point. It has to use its vision system to find the drill on the table. We did some preliminary training of, of how to use the drill, how to grasp the drill. Up in the top left, you see sort of this preliminary training stage. The robot was given a couple different uh, options of how to grasp the drill from the top, the side, left hand, right hand, et cetera. And it was, it was uh, it was allowed to explore, you know, find the different places, the configurations of the drill on the table where each strategy or a combination of, of top, side, left, right uh, uh, grasps actually work. And so here what you actually see is the robot learning, you know, how can I grab the drill effectively on the, uh, such that you can actuate the trigger? Um, 
And uh, you know, it doesn't get it all the time, but it's an exploration process. Um, on the right here, you, you see uh, sort of another layer of adaptation, which we think is important. Uh, not a priori learning, but you know, when the robot's actually performing the task, how can it re react to uh, failures? How can it correct if it, if it misses or if it collides with the bolt, et cetera? Uh, and the advantage here is that, of course, we know something about the environment. We know we're tightening a bolt. We might know that it's, you know, it's an, inch long, an inch wide. So we can use information to, to trim and prune the, the expectations of where the bolt is. So you can see that little figure there where it tries, it probes. If it runs into the bolt, if it misses, it can say, well, I'm pretty sure the bolt isn't here. I can readjust my estimate of where it is and, and, and refine that over time to actually get on there. And sort of as another layer um, in, in uh, adaptation here, what, um, what we think is important is that every time the robot performs the task, it should get a little bit better. We shouldn't just start, start the script, let it finish, and at the end, you know, we can start it again, but we didn't learn anything from the, from the beginning. So we really need robust performance over time where the robot can actually um, improve its performance, learn a little bit more. If it does the same task a thousand times, if something goes wrong, it should say, hey, something's wrong. Uh, so that's sort of, sort of what we, what we, how we view the autonomy in, in these sort of environments where we know something, but, um, but we want the robot to start uh, you know, making some decisions on its own. So I did have, this was, the pl this was an issue I had with the movie before, so just give it a second. I think it will, it will come. Um. Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, we, uh, we recently put a 3D uh, Ranger uh, depth, depth sensor in the robot's uh, head. Uh, this is not, um, we use, we're using the ASIS. It's, it didn't actually make the configuration that went to space. ASIS isn't exactly space ready at this point. But we really wanted to experiment with these new types of sensing capabilities and all the cool stuff through PCL and ROS that um, the people are using. So here's an example we essentially threw together in a week before we came to St. Paul, where the robot does some tabletop uh, segmentation uses simple characteristics about the objects on the table, essentially bounding box to say, should I go from the side, should I go for the, go for the top, should I orient the hand with, um, you know, along the major axis of the bounding box. Um, and with a relatively simple grasp strategy, just essentially a Palmer grasp reflex where, where when contact is made, the robot closes its fingers. Um, we were able to actually do pretty well for non-precision grasps, which is, to us, which is a great start. You know, it's not, it's not solving grasping, it's not solving the manipulation problem, it's not solving tool use, but just getting to the point where we can actually use the sensors to perceive the environment, um, make some simple decisions on what's going on, and actually do something is, is really exciting to us. So if anybody was at uh, ICRA last week, we brought the robot and, and he, he did this for hours, which was, you know, was kind of cool. So, I mean, I just want to emphasize, you know, we're just scratching the surface in terms of autonomy for this. It's, it's, it's sort of a new paradigm um, for, for the NASA and manufacturing situations, but, um, you know, we're seeing what we can do, and we're using Robonaut essentially as the platform um, to do that. Okay. So, um, all right, well, we didn't do that stuff with the old commander. We had to make some modifications. So what have we done? Well. We brought Ross to the system. That's why we're here. Uh, we said, hey, look, we need to be able to do this stuff. We need some tools to actually, um, to actually make the system more, more autonomous. Uh, so we, we reimagined the commander system. Uh, we, we left Windows XP. We left C Sharp. Uh, we went to Python. We went to Linux. And we said, at the high level, let's keep it the same. Visual programming language, great. It's, it's intuitive. It's natural. You can see what's going on, et cetera. Um, but let's. Uh, let's open up the, the sort of floodgates of functionality to the system. All right. So this is, this is the new commander. Um, you can see Robonaut in, in Arvis over there with interactive markers. Um, nice visualization tools that are nice to just sort of get the robot in the configuration you want. But as you can do that, then you can start putting in, you can put in the set points, you can put in the computation, et cetera. So how do we do this? So um, right here, you can see these black blocks. These are essentially Python scripts. We write Python scripts, and then we save them, and they become black blocks. Great. Then we can hook up the black blocks. Um, well, we can hook up the black blocks in, in, in different you know, non-parallel, non-linear structures, but we can also allow these scripts to get access to and send data to ROS topics. So these little green 
leaves hanging off. That's on the left side, we have ROS data coming in. On the right side, we have ROS data going out. We just specify the type. At runtime, we can parameterize with the specific topics, the, you know, type specific topics, and then the, the script inside is agnostic to the specific source of information. It just does the computation that it needs to. Um, and that's great, because now we can write more general programs and reuse them in different contexts with different sensors, different hardware, et cetera. Um, we can take these blocks and we can save them to a library that we can build upon. We can constantly add things to the library and then build new scripts out of that. Uh, the blue blocks here are, are hierarchical programs, so each one of those has its own little state machine inside. Um, and like I said, our viz, uh, our viz integration. So, um, also, this commander is very nice for, for prototyping or, or building up quick programs, et cetera, but once you actually have a program, you don't necessarily want to have to go through the state machine and run it from that and, and always watch that. So we wrote an RViz plugin. Here's a quick example at five times speed of um, just building a program from the library of skills that the robot has, uh, connecting them up, uh, connecting the ROS, in this case, services, um, saving it, great. And then our little commander plugin, which just lets us actually play it back. So that's um, the robot doing you know, two little skills that he had in his library, um, you know, showing off his muscles, et cetera. Um, and that was run on the real robot. I didn't catch the video um, of that, but you know, that's our viz echoing what the robot's doing. Uh, there's some organizational things we did. You can write your programs, you save them, you put metadata like tags, et cetera, and then in our viz, you can sort through using the tag information and say, hey, give me all the things that, you know, give me all the grasps that the robot has, et cetera, and then you can just start and stop those um, from our viz. So how does, how does the new commander work? Well, we still stuck with the control shell VxWorks uh, system at the, at the low level. Um, this is, again, the reliable real-time control systems. Um, but what we did is created a ROS bridge. And this was really just sort of to get us started, where we wouldn't have to redesign the low-level system, um, but how do we make the data to and from the robot accessible? We created a ROS bridge that essentially echoes the um, NDDS data into ROS. And then we created the system where there are a number of script engines. Script engines are ROS nodes, and they can be, there can be multiple ones on, on your, in your system. You can have lots of different computers running a script engine, but they're aggregated through uh, to the commander GUI, um, which is the centralized point of control, which again, like I said before, is very important from, from the end user perspective. And from, from that, that GUI, the, the operator can control both the load balancing um, or of, uh, and the distribution of, of how programs are run. If, Particular blocks need to be sent to particular machines. Maybe you have one block in there that's doing some intense visual processing. Distribute that to a particular machine. But because all those blocks are essentially sharing ROS data back and forth, then it's very easy to distribute. Um, the way we actually do it is we use zero MQ. Uh, we take the scripts, they're all Python, so we essentially just pi pickle up the scripts and then we send them over z zero MQ to the different script engines on the network. Uh, this was really meant so that we could have cross-platform uh, capabilities at the GUI level. The GUI is just QT, um, and then the, the computation actually gets, or the pieces of code get sent over zero MQ, which is platform independent. Um, or, um, but this was sort of just to get the ball rolling. Where we're going uh, next is to replace that low level system um, and the VxWork system with the bridge with something that's a little bit more integrated. Uh, specifically, we're, we're moving to Oracos. Um, I should make a little plug again for the, um, the birds of a feather talk at 10.30 where we'll talking a little talking a little bit more on this. But this was really important. And, and if for no other reason than as we build the leg system up, uh, we, we needed to be able to extend the software. The original control shell application, it's, if people don't know control shell, it's very much like Simulink. Um, and Simulink is very, to add a whole another two seven off uh, manipulators to that, it was very hard to extend the current system. So. What we did was took a step back and said, how do we have a more integrated um, entire system that can handle both the upper body and the lower body? And moving to a component-based architecture like Oracos uh, seemed like a natural fit. Uh, so we're actually working with Professor Lewis Sentis at UT Austin uh, to bring in his whole body control uh, uh, packages into the Oracos system, and that's how, how we're essentially going to control the four-limbed four manipulator in the future. Um, so we're happy to talk about some of that stuff you know, offline. So why ROS? Um, so a uh, number of different reasons, some of which you know, everybody, I think, sort of gets here between the standardization and modularization, et cetera. Um, the excellent tools for visualization and interaction, like Garviz and interactive markers, awesome, cool, great. Um, but what we really wanted to do, just to emphasize, is you know, move from having a robot that's capable of doing stuff to a robot that's actually doing stuff. And, and, and ROS is sort of bringing that computational smarts in a way where we don't have to 
um, write it all ourselves, you know, where we don't have to, um, or, yeah, I mean, that's really it when it comes down to it. <laughs> Um, so technical reasons, but also practical reasons. I mean, we, we're collaborating with a number of universities and different research labs. Uh, at GM, I work with a uh, used research lab, HRL in Malibu. Number of different people there. They're using ROS. It's very easy for us to now share code that can run on Robonaut without them actually having a Robonaut, because Robonauts are expensive. Um, and uh, you know, it takes it takes a community to build a Robonaut. That, that's all there is to it. Um, it's an incredibly complicated system, and, and we can't do it all ourselves. Um, and we wanted to leverage the best stuff that's out there, and it's great that every, we have such a, uh, the community here is witness to, to all the great stuff that's going on, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, now, of course, you know, we're, we are fighting the not-invented-here uh, battle at, um, uh, with, with the project, but, you know, um, the more we can show with the robot, the better, and, 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 and we're making good progress on that. So just a brief outline of what, what we have with Robonaut and Ross so far. We have a gazebo sim. Um, that was uh, the old gazebo. It looks like we're going to have to rewrite most of that for the new one, but that's awesome. Great. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're putting in, actually, ISS models into the gazebo. I've made some progress with that, so uh, that, will be, that will be exciting. Um, won't have all those dangling wires and such, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, we've done a lot of tests, preliminary tests, with different ROS packages out there, Gazebo, interactive markers. Uh, we've looked at the ARM navigation and warehouse viewer stuff that, that the guys talked about yesterday. Uh, some su success with that in simulation. We're, we're working more towards actually integrating with that with the real robot. Um, we've looked at Octomap, and as you saw, some of the tabletop manipulation work. Um, but there are a number of game, changer, game changers here that are helping us with um, essentially winning the battle and opening eyes at NASA and at GM on why why it's good to switch to these tools. Um, the visualization and sim tools, interactive markers, RVIS, all of that stuff, um, all, RX graph, you know, all the, all, the, all the cool GUI introspection tools um, are really important to have just outside of the box. And it's, it's, been, it's been really effective to be able to show that stuff really quickly. Um, again, int integration among collaborators and, and leveraging the, the state of the art research. Um, the gazebo simulation is available directly right now. We are fighting the long, arduous a battle of paperwork in, toward, in terms of actually putting it up on something like the open.nasa uh, project website. Um, although I talked to Tully a couple days ago, and he's going to help us maybe get it as an app get um, Debian package, which um, that would be cool. Um, and I think we can do that pretty quickly. So stay tuned for that. Um, so hitting, hitting the third bullet from the original, uh, that original outline, um, you know, what's missing? The robustness is the key issue here. Um, and this is something that I think everybody here is very sensitive to, and it was great to see a lot of people talk about that yesterday, that you know, how do we move from the research lab code, university lab, grad student lab code, to deployable systems that are actually reliable, and we can have performance guarantees, test you know, things that we can actually, claims we can actually make, make about the software we're running. Um, this stuff is absolutely critical as we move towards systems that go to space or go to systems that actually work with humans in factories. Um, and we're, we're pushing forward on, on logging and, and, and fault detection in Rossbag is great, but you know, as we talked about yesterday, there's still some limitations that I'm glad to see people are sensitive to and um, you know, that we're moving forward on. Um, also, just to, to talk a little bit about some of Morgan's uh, crackpot ideas, I mean, yes, we agree. Um, we've, we've talked ourselves about the reliance on a single Ross core master. If we can move to a more distributed system um, with redundancy on that, that's great. Um, and even on the service level, I mean, it's very, so if you think about an airplane, right, four motors, four engines, et cetera, one goes down, the aer airplane's still fine. We don't really think that way in terms of how we set up our ROS network, right? If one particular node that has some particular functionality goes down, maybe it's a graceful fail, but the system will basically stop doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so our crackpot idea, one of our crackpot ideas would be, well, what if you have redundant nodes that are actually providing the same information? So if you lose some, then at least you have some backup and you can continue doing what you're doing. Um, so what are the solutions? Well, we've heard a lot um, about uh, some possible, uh, possible approaches. I want to def definitely plug Sean in the Ross Industrial work. I think that they're, they're really pushing in the right direction in terms of adding the reliability, the testing, the performance, um, and at least characterizing what works, what doesn't. Um, we're very interested in what's happening there. Um, Ross Forte, it looks like, we, we haven't made the jump, but from, from what I've heard, there a lot of some of these issues, especially with things like health monitoring, et cetera, um, are starting to make their way into the official releases, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, also, from the Move It talk yesterday, it sounds the, the idea of having the benchmarking, et cetera, and the characteristics where it's publicly accessible, 
I think that's great. Um, and if we can take that paradigm sort of more general and really you know, as we characterize the different capabilities that people are bringing to ROS, uh, I think that would be really important. But, but this is, this, again, I think everybody's sensitive to this. How do we take the systems where we don't have to go in, 15 terminals open, lots of different launch scripts, make this stuff reliable so you don't really have to think about that and you can actually make some claims about how things actually work. Um, very important. So where are we going? Um, we saw the beginnings of, of Commander. Uh, just opening up to, to scripting languages and, and distribution is important, but we, we also want to put some more smarts in there. We want to add more complexity that, again, still maintains uh, easy-to-use interfaces at the high level, but also there's some smarts underneath. So we're starting to, to push in that direction and actually look at how we actually put in some machine learning, uh, some, you know, some smarts uh, underneath the hood. We're very interested in looking at things like automatic model building, data flow for health verification. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I run a block 100 times and then I run it 101st time and something doesn't look quite right, at the very least we should do is say, hey, something's not right. Pay attention to this. Um, that's very, very important. Um, state estimation, so as we go through, uh, we go through these uh, complex state machines, maybe we can actually add, add some predictive capabilities in there to say that, you know, given this data coming in, uh, with some probability I'm going to take this path out. That's sort of the precursor to actually putting some planning systems into, into it. Um, adaptive policies for writing data, so if I have a block, uh, right now it is general, you can reparameterize the topics at runtime, like I said, but what if the system took care of that rerouting at runtime? Well, for example, I see an object on the table, I should be sending my commands to the left arm versus the right arm. Types are the same, but where the data is actually going could be taken care of on, on, uh, on the robot side. Uh, and of course, we're, we're definitely looking at further integration across the board with all the different ROS packages that people are doing, um, specifically motion planning, uh, object recognition, grass planning, and, and you know, all the cool stuff that's going on. Uh, we do have a mobility platform besides the legs that's meant for you know, planetor planetary exploration. Uh, this is the Centaur 2 platform. It's sort of a spin-off of Robonaut. It uses the same series elastic um, actuation schemes for, for these um, articulate wheels. It's a four-wheeled platform. Um, and we can actually lift Robonaut off its, the, the development Robonaut that we have at JSC, lift it off its pedestal and put it onto, um, onto Centaur. We've done a number of things um, in, in the Arizona, Arizona desert with that, you know, picking up rocks, et cetera. Um, so, so that's cool, and it, it would be great to put that into Arviz and, and Ross and, and start using some of the navigation stacks. Um, but then, you know, a whole host of, of issues with that, rough terrain, um, outside sensing, et cetera. So, you know, that was, that was the short term. That's where we're going in the next couple of years. That's what we've been doing. But but it doesn't stop there. So I'm pretty much done, but I just want to end with, um, with this. Uh, and actually, I don't really want to say too much about it. I'll just let people watch it. You know, and if, if we get here, awesome. just to emphasize all simulation, all graphics, nothing really going on here. Um, but this is the hope. Um, I mean, I guess I'll add a little bit more. So, you know, there, there is a number of different maintenance tasks that the astronauts have to do. It's obviously very expensive, time consuming, dangerous to get the astronauts out there. Um, eight hour stretches at a time, possibly over multiple sessions. Um, if there was a robot outside, could navigate from one side to the next, actually do some repairs, go back to its little uh, doghouse that it might be sleeping in, um, then the, the cost benefit, you know, the cost, or the benefit uh, would be immense. So, anyway, I'll end with that. Thank you. Right. Um, so the, the question was, what's the taxonomy of tasks? What do we really want to um, do, and how do we characterize that on the space station, um, and how we go about doing that? Uh, I would say right now, 
we're not limiting ourselves. Uh, you know, that, that VelociCalc uh, example that I showed first, we weren't planning on doing that. You know, we sent up that task board. We, we sort of expected to do that. But the VelociCalc, basically one of the astronauts said, hey, can you guys do this? And we said, yes. And, you know, we spent a couple weeks and we did it. And great. You know, we want to help them uh, in a way that the astronauts want us to help them. There are a number of different things that we know that we sort of want to push forward. Uh, another example um, is... Uh, just basic chores that the astronauts have to do on a regular basis. Every Sunday or every other Sunday, they have to spend an hour or two cleaning down all the handrails, wiping them down. Um, you know, germs, obviously, a big issue. Uh, and that's definitely something, if we could free up a couple hours a week of the astronauts, let the robots scrub down the handrails, that would be a perfect task. But in terms of inside the space station, uh, we will do what people want, what, you know, what the astronauts want, what we can think of. It's really an experiment in and of itself. So. Right, so um, so Smash is great. Uh, I mean, I think the, the the biggest thing, the biggest difference is that you know my understanding of Smash. I haven't, I've looked at, it, I've watched some of the videos, but um, so uh, but it's still a scripting language. You create the state machine in Python or in a scripting language. Uh, we really wanted to move to a visual programming language where you really are assembling the blocks yourselves because that's very important again for people that are, you know don't know Python for astronauts, etc. Um, so so we wanted to keep with keep that very intuitive, non-expert user interface at the highest level. If you want to go and create your own Python scripts and do that, you're absolutely welcome to do that. You're not limited to it. But um, we, we wanted, wanted to draw that boundary that you didn't have to use things that way. And I think sma things like Smash um, still required a significant amount of you know, coding capabilities. Um, Uh, no, it's not permanent. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, the question was, is the robot going permanently blind? I, I made the comment that the, uh, the pixel degradation that we saw in those videos um, it, you know, gets worse over, over time. It gets worse over time in a session. Rebooting tends to, tends to make things um, okay. Um, but. Um, it does, and there are a number of different safeties um, that we've we modified the, the flight robot that beyond what we have on the, the development robots we have on the ground. Um, I can talk about that stuff, right? <laughs> sure. Um, so one interesting thing is we have what we call scrubbers. Is they're essentially these little boards on next to each joint which are constantly flashing the FPGAs at the motor control level. Um, there is degradation, uh, and obviously it's very important that our control loops on, on the motors actually uh, perform. So you know every, every little bit, every 20 minutes or so, we flash the... Um, we flash that with a, to make sure things are okay. So yeah, so we, we definitely have to address some of those issues. And that's inside. I mean, outside, it's going to be a whole, whole other challenge. Um. Uh, inside, it operates basically as it is. Um, he, the, the ground robots basically wear spandex suits, um, but the materials, there's a whole soft goods department that we have that has, is basically in charge of, of um, the materials for the robot that, that, that are up in space. Um, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Bad at that. Um, the question was, uh, do we need a spacesuit for Robonaut, or can it operate as it is? Um, um, I mean, what we do, we have, it's a spacesuit. It's not an astronaut, it's not like an astronaut spacesuit, but, you know, there are materials that we've added to, to make it operational in, on space. Um, there, were, there were some, a, a number of different safety checks on the software level, um, just to be very cautious about, you know, what state the robot's in, et cetera. Um, and, uh, yeah, so some significant upgrades on the, on the software side. Um, on the hardware side, beyond the scrubbers, um, duplicating the code. Um, so, yeah, redundancy on that level. Are there any sensors on the back of the robot? Um, no. Uh, most of the sensing is looking forward. Of course, we can move the head around. Um, we can't completely move it around, but most of it is, is looking forward. Uh, oh, in the back. Right. So the question was, during the demonstration where the, where the human got into, um, into the workspace of the robot and stopped the motion of, of the hands, you know, how... Um, how does the robot distinguish between a disturbance and an actual, you know, be compliant with respect to um, motion and, and what's going on there? I mean, what, what we're actually doing is we're, we're applying torque limiting to the control loops so that basically it just maxes out and doesn't try to exert too much of a force to try to get where it's going. Um, so that basically lets it be, um, you know, lets it be safe in, in that regard. But again, as I mentioned, we're running some, uh, what 
what's essentially a multi-priority impedance control law there, where we can control the stiffnesses and the compliance, um, both in joint space and the lower priority and in task space and Cartesian space at the higher priority. So it's a combination of, of you know, limiting what's actually happening and, um, you know, and, and, and the force that the robot can apply and then actually controlling the, the compliance characteristics. Um, uh, does Robonaut have, can he talk and can he listen, um, basically? Uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, we actually can start commander scripts by voice. Um, he cannot speak to us other than in sign language at this point. Um, and even that, we have to program that in ourselves. Um, but, um, but yeah, we're moving towards that. Um, of course, only really useful inside the space station, outside. Um, <laughs> he'll have to be waving and signing and, uh, and then. Um, Sure. So the question was really r with regards to, to teleoperation and that Robonaut's uh, sort of an ideal platform for um, teleoperation, for semi-automation, semi semi-autonomy, et cetera. Um, absolutely. Uh, Robonaut 1 was almost primarily a teleoperated robonaut, robot, robonaut. Um, but uh, Robonaut 2, um, as, as, as tried to convey, you know, we're, we're pushing towards more autonomous behavior, but we never want to completely get away from that. Um, there are some situations where it makes a lot of sense to still completely teleoperate the robot. Um, I, I can imagine, like in the, the EVA video there outside, uh, it's possible for the astronauts to teleoperate the robot from inside the space station to perform the man manipulation tasks. Um, personally, I think, you know, if there's some autonomy in there, let the robot take over, then that should help performance, um, at least in the long run. Um, but the problem, even with that situation, is that once you put those legs on there, uh, the system is very complicated. It's, I, I don't really expect astronauts to get into a four-limbed bodysuit to actually teleoperate those fairly non-anthropomorphic legs. So um, the complexity of the system and even the, 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 um, the embodiment of the system is, uh, is pushing away from the ability to really control it in the way the teleoperation is, is useful for. Um, more than that, we can't teleoperate it from ground. Uh, even though it's only 200 miles up or so, um, we don't have a direct line. We go through a number of different satellites to get there. Uh, so there still ends up being about a three-second delay from the ground to, uh, to station which makes uh, direct teleoperation actually kind of difficult. Um, but again, there, there are astronauts up there. We are sending fairly soon teleoperation gear so that they can begin to do that um, and get comfortable with that. And, as it and, and while it's still an upper body, it, it makes a lot of sense to still, um, to still try things like that out. So. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the bandwidth communication between the low level and the high level um, over that ethernet? Um, that's a good question. Um, we're definitely in the, the preliminary design of that. Um, it is all Ethernet over the wireless uh, network that the space station has. So it's a wireless network with a you know same sort of thing that we deal with. Um, uh, outside, I'm actually not so sure. I mean, there's different communication issues when when going to the outside of the space space station that um, you know maybe one of the other flight guys can actually uh, answer a little bit better. Um, but yeah, to be TBD really on that. Okay, last question, I guess. Right, didn't mention that at all. Um, so uh, across the board with, with Robonaut, there's, a, there's multiple sources of force sensing. Um, it's a series elastic robot. Um, he asked what sort of tactile sensors the robot has. Um, so it's a series elastic robot, so we can sense the, we can sense the, the uh, tor essentially the torques at each of the joints. Um, we have two absolute position sensors on both sides of a torsional spring. We measure the deflection, we get the, the torque out of that. Um, there are uh, four JR3 six-axis load cells that we have in the robot, one at the base of the forearm, one at the base of, of the arm uh, in, in the chest. Um, and then in the hand, uh, we, have, we can measure the strain on the tendons, so we can get some uh, force sensing from the tension uh, there. And we also have um, at least the capability of putting up to 14 in each hand six-axis strain gauges. These are custom devices that were designed by our collaborators at HRL. Um, and yeah, 14 in each of the hand, so basically at the tips and the different joints. Um, nothing on the palm as of yet, um, but that's actually, fa it's fairly effective to sense that through the springs um, and the rest of the robot. Not so much. Um, very difficult to deal with that stuff and the point-to-point -point control. Um, so now as we open up that new paradigm, we're hoping to really take advantage of some of that stuff. Um, so, okay, cool. Any other questions? Sure. Yep, so applications to General Motors. Well, like I said, I am actually a General Motors employee. Um, I work down at NASA, but, but I'm part of GM R&D. Um, we are interested, GM is interested in uh, 
advanced manufacturing. And what that basically means is saying it's very costly to go in um, and program these dangerous robots that we have to put in cages uh, to, do, to do all the work that, that manufacturing robots do. We want the robots on the floor next to humans, assisting the humans, taking over some of the arduous tasks. You know, when, ro when plant workers have to do the same physical, um, you know, dexterous task all day long, it's very uh, ergonomically difficult. Uh, if we can alleviate some of that burden, if we can even just take over a little bit, help out with the humans, hand them tools so that they don't have to you know, strain their necks and turn around, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately, uh, so that's sort of the human robot HR, HRI side of that. Um, but even more, uh, it th when, when things in the assembly line change, um, it's very costly to redesign new end effectors, redesign new fixtures for all the parts. Um, if we can streamline that process, have robots that are capable of using general tools, the same sort of tools as humans, being able to put objects down in locations that aren't fixtured, um, then you need a significant amount of perceptual and autonomy, uh, autonomous capabilities. So pushing towards a robonaut, which is sort of a general purpose, can do lots of things. Uh, it, it's feasible to not have to shut down the entire assembly line, phase in some new, new robots, et cetera. You can just upload a new skill, let the robot, and, or draw upon the robot's prior knowledge, potentially, at, at, at skills to, um, to quickly um, ease that turnover. Um, and so that's, that's really where we're going with the, with the um, sort of the future of advanced manufacturing as, as we see it. So. <laughs>